Good morning. I'm so happy to have you with us this day for another period of worship. And isn't it a joy to be able to gather together as a family to do that? I'm so happy to see some folks who have been with us for a while participating more in our worship. Done doing such a, a fine job in that, and, and we thank you for it. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 is our text today. We're going to see about Nehemiah that he was a man who had a mind to work. And isn't it important for us in life to have a mind to work? You see, Nehemiah was the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes I, the king of Persia. Nehemiah had heard that the walls had not been rebuilt around the city of Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah asks permission to do that, to, to take that task upon himself. In doing this, he demonstrates great skills in leadership and organization. As he sets forth to, to do this work, to build, rebuild that wall around the city, he divides the work into 42 sections. And he divides this plan in a way that the people who are going to be responsible for doing the work had a portion of work that was near their home. And just in those two points, the, the 42 sections of work and, and allowing people to work near their home, you can see how wise that Nehemiah was. And because of his leadership and his organization, the entire wall was built in 52 days. During that time, however, this time of building, these 52 days, Nehemiah and the people who were working with him faced much opposition. That opportunity, or excuse me, that opposition rather, is really not any different than the opposition that we face today in the Lord's church. And so as we look at some of the struggles that Nehemiah faced, we're going to be comparing those to the struggles that we sometimes face in the church. First of all, in the text that was read for us, Nehemiah 4, 1 through 6, we understand and see that Nehemiah faced mockery from without. I won't reread all of that text, but you can see in the discussion between Sanballat and Tobiah that they were making a mockery out of Nehemiah and the people who were building this wall. As a matter of fact, Tobiah goes so far to say this about the work that they were doing in verse 3. Whatever they build, even if a fox goes upon it, he will break down their stone wall. In other words, he says this is how flimsy, uh, this is how unstable their work is. That if a little fox was to climb up, the whole thing would crumble down to pieces. And so they were facing a, an intense amount of mockery from people who were without. Sanballat and Tobiah, they continued to, to ridicule the effort of those feeble Jews. Is the church ever, does the church ever face mockery from without today? You think about the, the way the religious world thinks about things, and, and particularly worship. And folks look at the church of our Lord and Savior and they say, well, these folks, they don't even use music in their worship. They say, these folks, they're too legalistic. They focus too much on the law. And the whole time they're mocking us for it. It's nothing new, friends. As a matter of fact, that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10, Blessed are the persecuted. And he drops down in, in verse 44 and he, he tells the disciples there to bless those who persecute you, who do evil to you, who, who speak bad of you. Bless those people. Pray for them even. 
And so Jesus, in doing that in the Sermon on the Mount, He's informing us that it's not a matter of if the church is going to face mockery and persecution, but a matter of when. And so when people begin to mock us for the things that we do, we just have to, to keep our heads down, focused on the work that the Lord has given to us to do, and plow forward like Nehemiah and these people did. What they did was simply kept on praying and building. And we need to do the same. Number two, we see that Nehemiah faced rubbish from within. Look at verse 10 of chapter 4. Then Judah said, The strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. And so here we see a, a little bit of discouragement from, from a fellow builder, apparently. And he says, you know, there, there's so much rubbish and garbage laying around that there's no way we're going to get this wall built. Sanballat had already referred to that in, in verse 2. And perhaps the seed of doubt that he planted was bearing fruit among some of the people. In verse 2, you may recall, he said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Stones that are burned? He's planting a seed of doubt in the minds of those people who are building this wall. And that was now bearing fruit among some of those people. You know, often, and you might be wondering where I'm going with this, but oftentimes the church faces rubbish from within. Uh, what I mean by that is, is sometimes we might have success in, in converting someone to, to bring them into the Lord's kingdom, to make them a member of the church of Christ. But you see, sometimes we have to unteach them the denominational doctrines that they've been taught, doctrines that are false. We have to unteach them those things and, and deal with the rubbish and sometimes the extra baggage that comes with them before we can begin to teach them the truth. But you see, let, let's not use that as, or, or let it not discourage us that that's the case. But let's use that as an encouragement because they are willing to let us help them with that. You know, it takes a lot of, of, uh, of gumption, I suppose, for a person to be willing to let us unteach them and to inform them that something they have believed all of their life sometimes is false. But you see, we are told that we have an objective standard, concrete, solid truth in God's Word. And when you look around some denominations today, it's not being taught. And so we have to deal with this rubbish from within. And so, again, let us not be discouraged if we have to go through that process. Rather, we, we continue moving forward and, and teaching people with patience and understanding and compassion. Not only did Nehemiah face mockery from without and rubbish from within, but he also faced force from without. Now, we won't read all of this, but in verses 7 through 23 of Nehemiah chapter 4, we see that, that, that Nehemiah was beginning to, to face some force from without. Let's read a few verses of it. Verse 7, It happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were being, uh, beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. That was the plan of all of the enemies of the Israelites. But, look at verse 9 as Nehemiah says, Nevertheless, we made our prayer to God, and because of them we set a watch against them day and night. And you continue reading here and you see that Nehemiah didn't stop building to face or, or to guard against this attack. He didn't stop the work. He continued the work while in one hand they held the building tools and in the other hand they held weapons. Now that's some dedication, isn't it? And even to take that a step further, uh, Nehemiah sets forth a plan where half of the people would, would continue the work and the other half of the people would guard in case there would be an attack. 
And he says, you know what? If you hear the, the trumpet sound in such a, a place, then you gather together there because there's going to be a battle. Nehemiah realized that with the scorn and the mockery when it failed, that his enemies were going to use force. But again, he kept praying and he kept building and instead of putting down the tools, he picked up the arms. You know, we are in a, 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 a similar type of war, aren't we? We're in a war with the devil. And the devil says, you know what, I'm going to go in and I'm going to attack the Longville Road Church of Christ. Just like Tobiah and Sanballat, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites gathered together and they wanted to attack Jerusalem, Satan and his minions are trying to attack the Longville Road Church of Christ. And if, if we, like Nehemiah and his people, will continue the work we're doing, while at the same time picking up arms and, and being sure that we are prepared to fight this battle against Satan, if we'll do that, then we, just like Nehemiah, will have success. You see, we can't put down the, the efforts that we're doing right now to fight this battle against Satan. That won't work. We have to do both at the same time. It makes Satan angry when he sees this church growing. It makes Satan angry when he sees people growing spiritually. John, it made Satan angry when he saw you get up here today and participate like you did. And he's going to come after you. He's going to come after each of us to try to discourage us. And so as we continue working for the Lord here in Kingston, we've got to be prepared to fight this battle. That's why Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we are to put on the whole armor of God. And he goes through and he lists each one of those pieces of armor and weaponry and what they're for. Most importantly, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to fight against Satan and his minions. And we know that if we do that, God will be pleased with us. You recall the words of, of Jesus in Revelation 2.10? The latter part of that verse where he says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Well, friends, being faithful requires working and fighting. He faced mockery from without, rubbish from within, force from without, but Nehemiah also faced greed from within. In chapter 5, verses 1 through 19, Chapter 5 deals with this greed that Nehemiah is facing from within. And again, we won't read it for the sake of time, but if you do go through and read it at home, you'll see that some of the Israelites had been borrowing money to fellow Israelites and apparently were charging a pretty hefty interest because of greed. And so people began to get frantic and upset with this because perhaps they couldn't repay the debts or, or whatever. But Nehemiah sees, right offhand, he sees that this is causing a trouble, a problem in the congregation of the Israelites. And there was strife among the workers. You know, oftentimes the greatest harm that can be done to the church is by its own members. A great harm was being done to the efforts of Nehemiah and these builders because of some of its own members. And sometimes the same is true in the church. Sometimes members start to bicker and, and fuss with one another because we don't always agree on everything. Sometimes people will pick up a juicy piece of gossip and begin to spread it through the church to the harm of one member or one family. Friends, may it never be so here. You know, among the seven things that the wise man said in Proverbs 6 that the Lord hates, you get down to the last of those and you read, He that sows discord among the brethren. That's something that God Himself hates. And when we are involved in sowing that discord by whatever means, God is not pleased with us and Satan is beginning to gain an advantage over us. And so what does Nehemiah do with this? If you read through the text, 
you see that Nehemiah, he didn't allow it to fester. No, he, he, he didn't allow it to fester. He immediately confronted the people involved and he condemned those who were the offenders. Do you think it would work? Let's say, if you are about to come and tell me a juicy piece of gossip, you know, something that has been on your mind all week long, something you just you can't wait to tell me about. How are you going to feel if I say you're gossiping and you need to stop? You think that's going to prevent you from, from gossiping and instead of me letting you letting the problem fester and get worse and worse? Well, hopefully. But you know, and I've been there myself so many times, what we do is just let it slide by like it's nothing. Friends, let me encourage you as a worker, as a builder here at the Longville Road Church of Christ, that when you see these contentions building, confront them. Whether it be gossip, whether it be bickering or fussing, whatever it might be, let's confront it and snuff the problem so Satan doesn't gain an advantage over us. So we can get our work done like it needs to be done. Next, Nehemiah faced compromise from without. He faced some compromise from without. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, we read this. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, that there were no breaks left in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors in the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they sought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent this message four times and I answered them in the same manner. You see, the enemies here are beginning to, to compromise a little bit. And, and, and what they want is for Nehemiah to come and meet them in the plain of Oh No. And Nehemiah knows what's happening. They don't want to get together to praise Him for the work. They don't, they don't want to get together to offer their help to Him. They're planning to harm Him. They pretend to be His friends, but they sought to do mischief to Him. Nehemiah realized that he couldn't stop the work just because, uh, or, or just to be had by the enemy. You see, there was actually no real fellowship between Nehemiah and these enemies. Tobiah, Sanballat, Geshem... There was no fellowship there because there were enemies. And Nehemiah was wise enough to know this. You see, in the church today, sometimes there's fellowship between good and evil. The forces of Satan and the Lord's church. But that's not what God intends. You read through the pages of the New Testament. And you come to verses like we find in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 6, where we're told not to have fellowship with those who are in darkness. We read uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica, where he says that if you find those who are teaching false doctrine, to mark them and to avoid them, but to reprove them as a brother. There cannot be fellowship between the Lord's church and Satan's army. There cannot be fellowship between the Lord's church and those who are in error. It can't happen. Nehemiah understood this and he wouldn't let it happen. He said, I'm not going to stop the good work that I'm doing just to come down here so you can do mischief to me. Not going to happen. And so they tried to compromise, but Nehemiah wouldn't have it. Next, Nehemiah faced slander from without. When all of the rest of this wouldn't work, when they couldn't uh, get to Nehemiah with mockery, when, when the rubbish wasn't enough to affect Nehemiah, when, when force wouldn't work, they began to threaten with slander. Let's look at verses 5 through 9 of chapter 6. Sanballat sent his servant to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall, that you may be their king. 
And you uh, also have appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. Then I sent to him, saying, No, such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. For they all were trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. And so the enemies, they gather together and they draft this letter threatening Nehemiah, slandering him and, and saying, we're going to send a letter to the king and let him know that you're trying to be, be the king of Judah. That wasn't the case. Nehemiah understood the importance of having this wall around the city. His enemies informed him that they would accuse him before the king of rebellion. But Nehemiah, what does he do? He doesn't fret about it. He doesn't wander around aimlessly saying, What am I going to do? What am I going to do? The king's going to kill me. No. Nehemiah simply denied the charges and he continued the work. He didn't fret about what was being accused. How about your life? You know, what I see here in the life of Nehemiah is that his life was such that it could stand on its own merits against any false charge that was made against him. And our life ought to be the same. We ought to be able to withstand those false accusations. They ought not to cause us to fret and to panic. We're going to face slander. People are going to look at us and say, well, you're not doing what the Bible says when we clearly know that we are. But you see, we just simply have to dismiss those charges and press forward. Just like Nehemiah. Let's consider real briefly this morning some lessons that we can learn from this. Practical lessons from the life of Nehemiah. Number one, we can often do more than pray. But we should never do anything without praying. You know, here they, they were doing more than praying. You know, they were building the wall. They, they were preparing themselves just in case an attack did come. But you see, they would not do it without prayer. And we ought to be the same way. We can often do more than praying, but don't do anything without praying. Number two, with a good leadership, much can be accomplished. With good leadership, much can be accomplished. Boy, you look at Nehemiah and you see how wise he was, how, how good of a leader he was. And you see the result. Much was accomplished. Well, just like that. Number three, with committed workers, much can be accomplished. See, it doesn't do our, our leaders here, to, it doesn't do them any good to be good leaders if they don't have committed workers to follow them. Nehemiah couldn't do this work by himself. He had to have committed workers following his lead. And the same is true in the church. You have to have committed workers to accomplish much. Number four, we must overcome obstacles that stand in the way of our goal. That's what Nehemiah was faced with time after time after time. Obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. The enemies from without. The mockery, the rubbish, the force, the greed, the slander. And you know what? He overcame every one of them. When we face those obstacles in the church, we must find a way to overcome them. There's a way. God will make a way. He's promised us that. Number five, challenge yourself to greater service. Challenge yourself to greater service. Do you ever, in, in, do you think in your mind that these Israelites ever thought it would be possible to rebuild this wall in 52 days? I imagine they thought that was probably an impossible feat. They weren't thinking they could get it done that quickly. I mean, we're talking about a huge and a massive wall around the city of Jerusalem. But you see, each one challenged themselves to a greater service. They pushed themselves beyond their comfort zone, if you will. Are you comfortable with what you're doing? Here at the Longville Road Church, are you comfortable with what you're doing? If you are, push yourself. I encourage you to step out of your comfort zone and challenge yourself to a greater level of service. And that way we will we'll accomplish much work. Finally, 
Number six, lesson learned. No matter who is on the throne, God is in control. No matter who is on the throne, God is in control. The king of Judah at this time, yeah, he was on the throne, but he wasn't controlling things really. It was God. And you see throughout this whole narrative, God is behind the scenes pulling the strings just like a puppet master would. He's in control. And that's the case today in our world. No matter who is president, Christ is still the king. I don't care who is occupying that office. Christ is still the king. God is still in control. It's up to us to follow Him. And so, despite all of the forms of opposition that Nehemiah faced, he and the people finished that work in 52 days. The one underlying key to their success, and I will leave this with you, is chapter 4 and verse 6 where we read, The people had a mind to work. Do you have that mind this morning? To work? God wants us to be workers for Him in His kingdom. Are you doing that today? Well, you can't start doing that unless you're one of His children. And He tells us very plainly in His Word how to become one of His children, to hear His Word, to believe that Jesus is His Son, repent of our sins, confess our faith in Him, and be immersed for the forgiveness of sins. If you've not done that this morning, you're not working to your full potential. And you're not pleasing God. Maybe you've done that this morning and you think, well, I'm not working uh, to my full potential as a child of God. Maybe I'm not pushing myself as much as I should. Well, change it today. You can change that today. If you need something to do, ask somebody. There's plenty that we can do. So friends, if you have one of those needs today, right now is the, the opportunity to change it, to correct it. Maybe you have some other need. We want to help you. Whatever you need, let us know right now while we stand and sing.